workers' worker safety. And just to say a few words about kind of like the research that is behind this talk. So I spent over three years doing field work um, in the Nordic region, uh, mostly among sex workers, but also among the police, uh, social workers and police makers and I interviewed uh, over 200 people out of which majority are sex workers and as I mentioned earlier my focus was on migrant sex workers because in uh, like in many countries in in Europe majority of sex workers come uh, um, outside so they are not national so here uh, in the Nordic region we can see that upwards 70 percent of people who sell sex are migrants and they mainly come from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, former socialist countries, uh, Russia, Nigeria, Thailand, uh, and Latin America. So the results of, uh, of my research are available at this policy brief um, uh, published by London School of Economics, Women, Peace and Security Institute. And I hope that the link is also shared to the uh, online chat. Um, the other link, uh, the, the only version that is available online is now the English one, but if you want the other language versions, just email me and I'm happy to share them with you. Um, they should be online very soon. So going to the findings. So this law was supposed to uh, tackle trafficking and pimping, uh, leave uh, sex workers alone and focus on buyers, pimps and traffickers. However, uh, my findings uh, uh, demonstrate that um, there is a great, great discrepancy between the discourse uh, that is behind this law that equates commercial sex with trafficking uh, uh, and, and exploitation and the realities of people in the sex trade. So in, uh, in my research, only a small minority of those interviewed were trafficked or forced by someone to sell uh, sex. And this is very much in line with international research. Uh, uh, that finds that that it's only majority minority that uh, are trafficked, um, and what emerged um, in in the research was that to earn money uh, was cited as the single biggest motivator, irrespective of people's feelings or interpretations of the sex trade. Um, and what is important to note here is that uh, thinking about migrant sex work, especially. Uh, is that the prices in the Nordic region are relatively high. Um, so uh, if you think about like in, in the Nordic countries, you can make 70 to um, 350 uh, euros uh, per hour, especially if you're a skilled sex worker. Um, so it means that this makes also sex work uh, uh, attempting, cross-border sex work attempting option for many because you can reach um, income levels that are not available uh, without higher education or not available in your home country. Uh, for example, um, in Romania, where many of, uh, many of the sex workers I met came from, uh, a take-home salary is around 700 euros a month. Uh, it's an amount that the skilled sex worker can do in a couple of hours. So, um, so I, I just want to uh, read this quote from uh, a Romanian sex worker and a mother of two who talked about uh, her motivations to engage in sex work uh, in the Nordic region. And she says that uh, I'm not crazy about money. I want what is best for my children, a normal life, chocolate, toys, normal things. But if I do normal work in my country, I cannot live a normal life. In my home country, the system is corrupted. I could, for example, work in a bakery. The salary is 300 euros. Uh, and, and, and Sorina, this woman, um, had a qualifications uh, to work in a bakery. And she said, how can I support my, my two children with that? But money isn't everything. On the street, you can die any minute. I'm returning to Romania because I have two children. I'm turning 28 soon. I own a house. I bought land and built it. I paid it with this work. I have also saved uh, money, not much, but uh, enough so that I can open some business, so that I can live a normal life in my country. I'm tired of this stress. So um, what we can see from this uh, uh, extract from Serena and also from the overall research uh, is that uh, how important it is to challenge this victimizing perspective that is embedded in the Nordic model approach and also in these acts um, like Online Safety Act 
and see both sex work and migration as forms of economic agency um, and survival. So um, for many uh, migrant sex workers, the lack of opportunities they face at home uh, motivated their migratory projects. Also for domestic uh, uh, sex workers, uh, sex work was often a way to manage uncertain life situations, patch the safety nets of the welfare state or finance studies and other um, life projects, or just to have more control over uh, one's working hours and, and one's labor in general. Moreover, as like Sorina's example demonstrates, uh, sex work was often a temp temporary strategic project to advance one's life, for example, to educate uh, one's children, finish studies or build a house uh, and start a business like, like Sorina did um, uh, a true sex work. So this was just to give a glance on kind of like the realities of sex workers in the Nordic region and their motivations for sex work. I will now uh, move to the policing uh, of sex work under the Nordic model. So what are the consequences of, of the sex biocriminalization? So despite the explicit aim of the Nordic model to shift attention away from people who sell sex, uh, they still remain main target of policing. Uh, what I found out was that the sex buyer criminalization had a minor role in policing. Instead, it functioned more as a, a smokescreen for punitive and racialized policing of sex workers that often led to evictions and deportations and overall police harassment. Um, and I want to read this quote from, um, from Lena, uh, who's a Latin American um, trans sex worker. Uh, because she summarized really well in an interview uh, the consequences of the of the Nordic or the um, Swedish model. This is a contradictory law. They kind of let you work, but they control you. In the end, they force you not to work. They say that you can work, but you cannot work in an apartment because then the owner is criminal. You cannot work in a hotel because then the hotel is criminal. Here you cannot call the police if you're in trouble. If somebody is violent, robbing you or something, Maybe if you're foreign, the police will put you out of the country. They say that this law is for the women, but it isn't. And to understand these kind of contradictions that, that Lena is describing, we need to look at the regulation uh, uh, around commercial sex uh, in the region more in detail. Because often when the Nordic model is, is um, marketed, it's just said that it focuses on, on sex buyers, and, and traffickers and the other laws are not discussed and how, how they uh, can be used in policing of sex work. So even though Nordic uh, countries have decriminalized the sale of sex, it is still a ground for deportation in their immigration laws. Uh, the countries also have very broad, uh, broad third party legislation whereby all assistance of, uh, of, uh, of sale of sex um, is criminalized even if it's not for profit, even if you don't get any money or you just help your friend, uh, it's criminalized. And kind of the biggest problem with this one is that um, that the um, uh, regular hotel owners and landlords can be accused of pimping if somebody does sex work on their premises. And the police actively uses this pimping law uh, to uh, as a way to clear uh, sex uh, work out of indoor markets by informing landlords that if they do not evict the person, um, they are accused of pimping. And this is kind of a very easy way for the police to use. Uh, this law also criminalizes working together, hiring security or a driver, and in general reduces sex workers' uh, safety. Um, so in other words, we can see that through the Aliens Act uh, and, and the pimping law, selling of sex is de facto criminalized uh, through the enforcement of these policies. And, and the, the, the police uses this to suppress the, uh, the sex trade to through harassing sex workers. Um, and what I found out was that the, uh, the policing of sex work was highly racialized. Uh, the police focused on whatever people they perceived as foreigners. And of course, this... Um, uh, this policing of sex work under the Nordic model uh, has led to worsening uh, relations between officials and sex workers, and people were really afraid to report uh, violence and exploitation to the officials fearing the consequences. And to illustrate this, I will read this quote um, from Mary, uh, who's a Nigerian woman with a residence permit 
residence permit uh, on in Spain and who had been uh, working in the Nordic region uh, for some time. And the first thing uh, uh, when we talked, um, she started to talk about was uh, the fear of the police. Uh, and she she states, here we have the fear of the police. I have pressure. If you're walking on the streets here, sometimes they control you, check your ID. Okay, but you're from Spain. They say you have to go to the ticket office. You have to go back to where you came from. You have to go back to Spain or Italy or wherever you came from. Um, they will ban that person to not to come here for, for four to five years. That's the reason why we're afraid. If you have a European passport, they're a little bit nicer because most of the people with European passport have a job here. They have finished documents. I'm not like them. They have two jobs, work in the street and work in the factory. They don't get shocked like me when they see the police. So in light of these findings, it's not maybe surprising that the vast majority of people I talk with uh, oppose the sex buyer law and support removing criminal penalties related to the sex trade. Um, so what people wanted was that they could work uh, in in safe environment, uh, they could screen their clients, and uh, they would not have to be afraid of officials in case uh, they had trouble uh, with their clients or other things. Before I move to conclusion, I just wanna say a few words about the service uh, provision. So if we think about, um, uh, so there's often this benevolent aim behind uh, these policies, and uh, also in the Nordic model, the social and support services were supposed to be the backbone uh, of this policy to which the criminalization of the of the buying was meant to be only a normative sub supplement. And what we can see is um, that uh, these services have not, however, uh, realized. For example, Sweden hasn't invested any money on, on support services or, or any services for sex workers. Instead, most of the funding has gone to policing and training of, of officials. Um, and of course, the majority, uh, the problem um, is that the majority of people uh, uh, working in sex work uh, are, are migrants without permanent residence permit, and therefore they're not uh, entitled to state services. And, and this quote from the, uh, from the Swedish social worker um, illustrates well the problems uh, of this kind of uh, of this Nordic ap approach and not having any uh, access to services for migrants. Um, so there's a lot of like state services for nationals and they can get it uh, immediately. Um, but we have nothing for the other ones. If they are lucky, we can provide them with a ticket back to Romania. So it's not easy. It's not easy for them. OK, moving to summary and conclusion. Um, so. What we can see is uh, how this um, criminalization of sex by buying actually has punitive consequences on, on sex workers. So they remain the main target of policing and become de facto criminalized through other uh, laws and policies and their enforcement. It has led to racialized policing and ethnic profiling of sex workers. And, and sex workers have become targets of deportations, forced evictions, and overall uh, police harassment. In the policy brief, I also talk about increased stigma towards sex workers uh, by clients and overall society, and how it also hampers sex worker safety practices when the clients don't want to reveal their identity um, to, the, uh, to the sex worker. So in a way, it, it uh, kind of, transfers the power balance where sex workers need to focus making their clients safe instead of clients um, uh, ensuring the sex worker that they are uh, safe. So in conclusion, we can see that despite this rhetoric of protecting women and tackling trafficking, the main goal of the Nordic model style regulation uh, is the abolition of commercial sex and this abolition is achieved not through the buyers, but through punitive policing of sex workers that produces increased vulnerabilities for violence and exploitation, especially for migrants and other marginalized sex worker groups. Uh, so in other words, this um, the evidence from this study indicates that the Nordic model is not a model to be replicated, but rather a complex regulatory apparatus designed to disrupt the commercial sex market.
thank you. I'll end here. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, yeah, that the de facto criminalization just through kind of harsh laws, it's it, it feels like that's that's a potential from um the Online Safety Act, as as is, especially with the invisibility of workers um in there. Thank you so much for your time. So now um we have the uh, wonderful Dr. Carolina Eyre, um, who is senior lecturer in lecturer in criminology, here to talk with us um, today. Hi, come Hi on there, down. thank you. <laughs> uh, you've given me an extra title. I'm actually just a researcher, but thank you. You know, manifesting. Well, there we go. There you go. <laughs> I will be sharing my screen. Um, in the meantime, just wanted to let you know that I do talk a lot. So if you are over it and if it's beyond my time, feel free to tell me off. I would also like to say that if you see some nice and snazzy graphics of booties and beautiful women, I did not draw them. I uh, bought them from Exotic Cancer, whom I really recommend you should follow because she's an incredible sex worker act, um, artist. So today I will be talking to you about uh, my research on what uh, laws that are meant to actually help trafficking victims really do to sex workers and sexual content online in general. Um, I should also say, if you are from Ofcom, you are probably already sort of familiar with what I'm going to say because I did submit to the public consultation and present to you guys, but I'm going to contextualize this today even further within the space that we're working in. I will be talking about the creator economy, the uh, consequences of foster sesta on platform governance, how that affects creators' mental health, um, and also how um, a lot of... Um, Essentially, apparently positive um, decisions can actually then be uh, weaponized against content creators and sex workers as well. And I will then be talking about the emotional and financial impact of the censorship that Foster Sessa has brought um, to sex workers. So um, what is flagging and why does it matter? Flagging is probably one of the main reasons for um, which sex workers and people sharing nude and sexual content online get deplatformed, aka censored and deleted. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially a, a mechanism for reporting content to social media platforms that allow users to express their concerns about platform governance. So you see content that you think violates community guidelines, you report it. The issue is that we don't know if platforms actually care about those flags too much because they don't communicate how and if they are being taken up. They become a shield for platforms to hide behind when uh, they take down content. They can just say, well, people reported it to us, it's bad. And there's also quite a lot of research, including my own, that shows that particularly if content is already frowned upon by platforms, be that nudity, sex work, sexual expression, it tends to be vulnerable to flagging even more. So what flagging essentially does is outsource or algorithmic pro uh, progress and processes to users um, so that platforms can hide behind that. Um, what this results in is what um, researchers have called user-generated warfare. So uh, one or more users can form a coalition to get certain things that they either disagree with uh, the platformed or even to just fight people that they don't like. And while nudity and sexuality have borne the brunt of censorship post foster sesta, this is also now happening in one wider political scenarios, like in the Ukrainian conflict with Russian trolls getting content about Ukraine taken down, and obviously now with the war on Gaza, uh, that happens to Palestinian content as well. And I think it's important to talk about flagging in general within the Online Safety Act context, because in Ofcom's proposals, there's a section on trusted flaggers can, that can signal that some content should be taken down. Those are usually companies or, you know, trusted people within specific organizations. But as we will see now, flaggers can be biased and can have their own agendas. So whether they are individuals doing that through platforms or organizations doing that on behalf of Ofcom, it's increasingly important to vet those flaggers and to see why they are doing certain things. Now, um, we um, have talked about offline sex work mainly so far, but obviously sex work is also a crucial part of the content creator economy, which seemed like a democratizing force for a variety of workers, including sex workers. Um, 
it seemed like it allowed the every man or the every woman or the every person to uh, join into cultural production and entertainment. And of course, particularly within the sex industry, it meant that um, hiring practices and recruitment practices from traditional studios were not as important when it came to OnlyFans uh, workers. It also seemed to give people a lot of flexibility when it came to choosing when, where, and how much to work. And it did promise this idea of unprecedented fame and wealth, particularly for people that were from underrepresented demographics, but somehow had a, had a big following online that would warrant quite a lot of earnings through uh, subscri subscription sites. However, there are challenges within the creative, uh, the creator economy, particularly because it's tied to variables that are outside of creators' control, particularly if they're sex workers, because the visibility promised by online platforms is always within reach reach, but it's not guaranteed, particularly because of censorship, because of um, practices like shadow banning, because of success being tied to likes, views, following and engagement, and essentially being ruled by a very impenetrable algorithm, meaning that workers in general and sex workers in particular have to resort to what my colleague Sophie Bishop calls algorithmic gossip. So exchanging theories about what works and what doesn't um, through the algorithm, meaning that there's a lot of free labor that goes into content creation as well. How has Foster Sesta, which has already been brilliantly introduced by panelists before me, been translated into community guidelines? Well, it's wreaked havoc on the way social media are run and the way platforms have reacted so far has been through incredibly broad, but also particularly discriminating community guidelines. So I am personally quite scared of what the Online Safety Act is going to be like when it comes to the translation into social media community guidelines. On Instagram, an example from Foster Sesta is that uh, spam and nudity are written in the same sentence. So essentially, Instagram is assuming that if you're spamming, if you're if you're posting nudity, you're spamming people. They don't Acknowledge that nudity can be a form of work, it can be a form of art, it can be a form of expression. Um, also, when it comes to the offering and selling of sexual services, so as panelists before me have argued and explained brilliantly, sex work is work. Well, not for Instagram, because it's written in the same paragraph as terrorism, organized crime and hate groups. So for Instagram, if you're trying to support yourself through sex work, it's as bad as if you're bombing a place, apparently, which is not very encouraging. And then, you know, TikTok uh, with its even younger user base, although that's been disproven recently, that they're very mindful of culturally appropriate content, which is a very handy shield, again, to hide behind not wanting to, to host specific posts. So... Um, to make matters worse, platforms have this incredibly incredibly sneaky uh, implicit solicitation policy, which means that if you share a picture that they deem to be spicy with an offer for communication, which can even be just a reference to a link, you might get deleted. But this is not um, explained properly to users. So this triggers more and more deletion deletions by the day. All of this is obviously algorithmically enforced. The chances to appeal are few and far between. Uh, between um, appeals are glitchy and inconsistent. So this has created an infrastructure where platforms are forced to moderate at scale because they have laws like Foster Sesta essentially forcing them to do that. And at the same time, they have nothing to force them to uphold freedom of expression, particularly for users like sex workers. So they are encouraged by law to do what they're doing. Um, what I'm presenting to you today is largely coming from surveys and interviews that I've done amongst content creators of all sorts, but mainly nude and sexual content creators and sex workers. Um, and I will be introducing this idea of incre increasing online precarity. And we already know that offline precarious em employment affects health and well-being for people. Uh, it's not nice to... Uh, live through financial anxiety and job insecurity. If anyone looking for jobs uh, in Tory Britain is familiar with that, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and when there is a power di a differential between employees and employers, or even intermediary and employee intermediaries and employees, the situation becomes even more worrying. Plus, um, 
for a lot of people sharing their body online, whether they're sex workers or artists or people expressing themselves, uh, a lot of that becomes part of your identity in the sense of this is how you support yourself. This is how I express myself. And the loss of that identity, the loss of uh, your vehicle to express yourself also has terribly, uh, terribly negative impacts because platforms are telling you not only that you're not able to be there, but you're not able to be there because of who you are. And that's even more uh, troublesome for creators. Uh, so as I mentioned, what I'm presenting today comes from surveys done amongst 123 users plus 12 interviews to infer the way Instagram and TikTok approach flagging and deplatforming. To take part, users had to feel like they had been deplatformed on the back of negative comments, which is what I and a variety of other people have shown sometimes tends to happen uh, when you're trying to reverse engineering uh, flagging. Essentially, you get a lot of negative comments, you get a lot of hate targeted at you, and then suddenly your content goes down. So if people had experienced these things, I was interested in talking to them and I recruited them through social media. I um, This has generated a lot of papers that you can find in the, in the bibliography that I will be sharing later. But um, something that really uh, essentially was devastating for people that came out of these interviews was that people could go on personal crusades against them, particularly if sex workers had had a bad interaction with a client that turned sour, but also content about legal and safe abortion, sex education about contraceptions, stories of sexual assault survival were targeted by specific flaggers, be that incels, be that anti-sex work people, be that clients or uh, fans that had turned sour. And um, it, this targeted even lay users, they maybe they you know they posted a comment that someone didn't like so people weaponized their whole following against them and then even worse for sex workers their content was removed for adult nudity and sexual activity even when they were not posting about sex work so because appeals were then so useless people had to pay for hackers they they got scammed they were never able to speak to an actual human moderator to explain what they were doing with their profile and even worse uh, they were then impersonated and their impersonators contact, um, content and profiles were, was not deleted, but theirs was. So again, you see this power imbalances between the, the nude and sexual content creators, the sex workers that are just trying to survive and, and work through platforms and this infrastructure, which is rigged against them because of laws, because of offline stigma, because of people that are essentially just using um technology against them. Now, I will not uh, redo the quotes in details because we don't have that much time, but needless to say, this left people feeling stressed, low and depressed, experiencing cycles of shame in spaces that had previously felt um, inclusive. And even for artists exp experiencing a chilling effect on, about what they could and couldn't post, it affected the art that they created because they felt that whatever they posted was gonna get them censored. So it made people feel like their presence of online was precarious and transient. Um, People said that they were forever finish, finished doing art for, um, full time. Uh, some sex workers' earnings went from 8,000 a month to 3,000 a month. So a very tangible loss of money. And people even lost access to opportunities, to people being able to contact them um, and define this experience as a horrendous grieving process, meaning that they lost everything. So this is an emotional loss, not just a financial loss, not just a loss of opportunity. This is a loss of what they stood for, how they express themselves. Um, so essentially what... Um, I found through my research and what I sadly keep finding is that sex workers bear the brunt of flagging and deplatforming of an infrastructure that is meant to be about safety, but is actually anything but for sex workers. This results in job and income uncertainty and with a lot of feelings of powerlessness. So I do have some uh, recommendation to end with, but I think it's important to note that 
when it comes to tackling online safety, we seem to care about everyone's safety, but sex workers' safety. Uh, Non-celebrity bodies, nude and sexual content creators, sex workers, they are not afforded the same humanity as any other user. And their moderation is actually void of consent because they are assumed to be performing some sort of sex work or sexual activity, regardless of what they do, even when they're just talking about their family life or their everyday life. They don't have the same right as every other user and as every other worker. And by governing like this, platforms are handing the reins of their governance to their most conservative users and in particular to harassers. The fact that social media platforms are not forced to guarantee freedom of expression makes their approach to governance and in particular, in particular to appeals cavalier and negligent. This means that platforms are obliged to take a lot of stuff down but nobody is telling them, hey, actually, this is people's work. This is people's lives. And if you do take it down, then you have to have a quick reversal mechanism that works and works fast. This means that they greatly underestimate the importance that the network support and creativity that they provide gives to users. So to conclude, platforms should be way more transparent about their decision Ideally with personalized notifications, I know that that is difficult, but their current moderation at scale, which is only algorithmic, is not helpful for anyone. So they should invest in teams that are specifically about the platforming and particularly the platforming of contentious topics like sex work, like uh, war, like misinformation, because sometimes the line is incredibly fine. The nuances are so relevant that you can't just leave that to an algorithm. I know this is wishful thinking, but the incredible Zara Stardust uh, with um, her whole research center has written a really uh, pivotal manifesto for sex positive social media that I really recommend everybody should read because what it says is that platforms should destigmatize sex and recognize its cultural, social and political value and recognize that it's not inherently harmful, which would then lead to recognizing online sexual labor. Plus, what's striking to me is that Currently, if you're deleted, you're deleted. There's no rehabilitation for you. Like even if you go to jail, technically, then there is a form of rehabilitation there. While if you post a nipple on platforms, like that's done for you. Like that's completely disproportionate. It makes no sense. And lastly, we should recognize that censorship is a harm. Censorship, deplatforming, it, it they exclude workers from spaces. They push people further underground. So they should be seen as a harm in the same way that abuse is seen as a harm. So the same emphasis on tackling harms should also be put on reversal mechanisms like appeals uh, for platforms and for their users. So this is me. I'm sorry, I hope I haven't depressed you too much, but thank you so much for listening. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Carolina Air. there. Um, I have some very personal experiences with everything you've been saying. In fact, I can't even report accounts that use my images to scam other people because it's um, considered malicious. So that's uh, that's quite crazy. It's crazy. Um, but thank you so much for all of your all of your thoughts and information there. It was really useful to everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying the conference so far. So we have um, Alba Giatto to speak, and then we will be having a short break and we'll be returning at 1.30 um, and we'll just catch up that little bit of time that we've lost but first let me hand over to Alba. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Alba Hato or AJ for um, my British speakers who may struggle with that second name um, and I'm going to be presenting today if my computer would like to work. Uh, can you all see that? Is that all right? Can you see that at all? Yeah we can see. Perfect. Um, so you might I want to zoom in. Uh, let me see. Otherwise, I'll just share it differently. Canva is such a little bitch. Um, sometimes. Okay. That yes, should perfect. Be better. Thank yeah. you. Perfect. So uh, I'm AJ, a PhD student in philosophy and history of art. I'm an artist. And I'm, I'm also an on and off sex worker. And welcome to Hardcore, how porn censorship harms women artists which is uh, not something you hear every day. So this is what we're gonna be having a quick look at today. And first and foremost, I would like to introduce you 
to the idea of dissident identities, right? It's important to understand that dissident identities are intersectional. A lot of women artists engage in sex work because it is accessible and it leaves us time to work on our own art, which is the same reason why a lot of women who have kids or people who have kids will be engaging in sex work because they can pay the bills and take care of their kids at the same time. Additionally, our identity may intersect with you know, other groups like queer folk, migrants, BIPOC. These identities are all dissident identities, effectively second-class citizens when it comes not only to regular citizenship, but particularly to digital citizenship. And I would really like you to kind of like keep this weird Venn diagram in mind as we progress through my little presentation. So let's start by looking at kind of like the forefathers, if we may, of the Online Safety Act, right? Let's start by looking at two pieces of British Victorian law so we can understand kind of like how censorship is deeply, deeply tied to colonialism and the empire, and particularly how censorship is applied through the lens of public health and uh, public order. The CDA, the Contagious Diseases Act, uh, originally it seemed like a series of regulations for cattle, but it's actually the first time that British law regulates prostitution. Unfortunately, the law didn't really define what a, a sex worker, a prostitute was or wasn't, which allowed the police to, in the words of historian Eric Berkowitz, take aggressive measures to enforce the law. This meant that they got to decide who was a sex worker and how they were going to be punished. And then the Obscene Publications Act, which we kind of like still have to this day in a very different form, is a very interesting piece of legislation because for the first time it allows a magistrate, as in a single person, right, to um, become a censor, to fully be able to declare any literary, literary or artistic work obscene and, and orderly destroyed. So if a magistrate, which is obviously usually at this point in history, a man, a white man embedded in a structure of, of empire and colonialism decides that a particular work of art is obscene, then that work of art can be destroyed. So just keep that in mind as kind of like a bit of historical flavor. And let's look at the climate, the background against which the obscene, uh, sorry, <laughs> Online Safety Act uh, has been born. Let's look at half a century of censorship in Britain. First and foremost, we have the obscenely famous, if I may make that joke, Section 28. Uh, Section 28 was passed in 1988 as part of the Local Government Act, and in the words of activist Dan Glass, it was simultaneously vague and all-encompassing. And this is a problem that we are going to encounter both in the Online Safety Act, in Fausta Sesta, as uh, my co-panelists have already mentioned. And this has been proven to be time and time again, a very effective mechanism in targeting dissident identities. The vaguer, yeah, the wording of your, of your act, of your law is, the more people, dissident people who are already falling through the cracks continue to fall down those cracks. With section 28, activists feared that uh, this was going to mean, you know, invalidate employment and housing rights for queer people, uh, threaten hostels for homeless, queer people, um, particularly uh, they were concerned that this would mean that queer people would like access to resources and meeting place. And of course, indeed, all of that happened. Moving on from section 28, I'd like to take a look at one of my favorite censorship cases, and that is the rape scene in The Romance in Britain. The Romance in Britain is a play written by Howard Benton, and it was first staged in the 1980s. And it, was a, uh, it has a very famous rape scene. And this was the reason why the play and the director were subject of a private prosecution by the very infamous Mary Whitehouse, who was a kind of like a very conservative uh, campaigner. She was a conservative moral campaigner. She didn't actually watch the play. She sent, she sent someone to watch it because she was afraid that it would compromise the integrity of her soul. And what's really interesting is that the, the case uh, was finally, um, first it was dismissed, then the private prosecution lost. But the defense's uh, argument was that there was no pornographic intent behind the scene, that the, the rape scene hadn't intended to titillate the audience. To me, what this says is that the dissident and deviant sexual acts can only be allowed to exist if they are not seen to be promoting that kind of deviancy that they are portraying. And by deviancy, I don't mean that this was a pro-rape scene. What I mean is that this was a homosexual scene and therefore it couldn't seem to be representing 
homosexual sex or promoting homosexual sex in any meaningful way. Next, we have this Spanner case. Anyone uh, who's part of the BDSM community, I'm sure is familiar with this. Uh, Operation Spanner during the 1980s was a police investigation into gay uh, sadomasochism that ended up with 16 men being convicted and this conviction being upheld by the European courts. Few cases illustrate the loss of agency that the citizen pervert uh, may experience as well as the Spanner case does. The citizen pervert is a term coined by David Bell, um, and I'm sure particularly coming from Carolina's presentation that you can see which kind of people are a citizen pervert. This is someone who doesn't conform to normative sexual citizenship and is exactly on the slash of the public-private split, irreducible to either domain. This means that the law erupts into, into this privacy, right? And uh, it, it erases the private as a site of pleasure and it renders pleasure a public, therefore political issue. So citizen perverts are not allowed to have any privacy. And this is made particularly stark uh, when it comes to the Spanner case because uh, the resulting judgment of the Spanner case was that consent was not a valid legal defense for actual bodily harm in Britain. However, in 96, in the Court, Court of Appeal, they overturned the conviction of a husband who had branded his initials on his wife's buttocks with his wife's consent, saying that consensual activity in the privacy of the matrimonial home was not a matter for criminal prosecution. Why did a heterosexual couple, like let's, let's think for a moment, why did a heterosexual couple get granted their privacy while 16 gay and bisexual men didn't? we really have to be aware of how deeply embedded, you know, anti-queer sentiment, anti-BDSM sentiment, anti-kinky sentiment sometimes is particularly in the, in the establishment and, and when it comes to the processes of the law. Then we have uh, the reason for one of my favorite protests ever in England, the audiovisual media service regulations. They were passed in 2014 and they resulted in widespread protest all across the UK, including a face sitting protest in front of parliament in December, 2014. Now the law, well, the <laughs> regulations actually targeted uh, mostly acts associated with female pleasure and female domination, such as female ejaculation. And this was something that the now defunct feminist magazine Bitch actually called attention to. Thankfully, most of these were overturned in the 2019 overhaul of the Obscene Publications Act. And finally, to finish with this little bit of the presentation, the 2019 British Board of Film Classification Guidelines. I just want you to pay attention to, from a purely artistic point of view and a purely artistic freedom point of view, to how many BDSM scenes, how many scenes that may explore complicated themes are completely being put out of being considered a serious film because they don't comply with with these guidelines. These guidelines say that those pieces of art, those pieces of pornography cannot be considered serious work. Now, let's quickly look at what does online censorship actually censor. So let's keep in mind all of that history that the Online Safety Act has been born kind of like, you know, on top of. Uh, in the screen, you have some of the mechanisms and, and some of the institutions behind most of the online censorship faced by, by sex workers. But what do they actually censor? I'd like to introduce you to this magnificent um, graphic that Sophie Lutter, who's a great sex worker and activist, is allowing me to use. If you see, OnlyFans mostly doesn't allow any kind of like kinky, queer acts of expression. And more importantly, I think it shuns menstrual blood and hypnosis. I think anyone who's into this for women's rights should be aware that you know censoring menstruation is not usually a great thing. But also, uh, hypnosis is a fetish that's mainly used in the femdom community, and it doesn't really um, conform to most legal definitions of illegal sexually explicit material. Right? It doesn't contain explicit violence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So why would there be a need to censor? Why would be, you know, Visa and MasterCard so very interested in censoring this? Because that's where this particular regulation uh, comes from. You know, who, what, what, what women is this thing liberating? What, what, what are we doing by censoring femdom hypnosis videos? 
Finally, what does the Online Safety Act mean for dissident artists and pornographers? So first of all, the index on censorship says that this is going to be an absolute catastrophe for freedom of speech. Um, it, and the main problem is, as we have said, that the, the wording is very loosey-goosey, right? Which is why we're all here today. It doesn't refu it refuses to define what legal but harmful means. And this means that platforms will play it very safe. Historically, this means that only they are only going to allow cis, white, thin, heterosexual content to exist. And for more on this, besides obviously recommending Carolina's work, which is fantastic, I also recommend everyone to have a read of The Internet Closet by Alexander Monea, which has a very great history of censorship on the internet. Then some other consequences will be that the UK government will be able to directly silence user speech in any platform. And more importantly, the bill also undermines global encryption standards. If you put together censoring your citizens and being able to access the private information, I'm sure I don't really need to tell you where that is leading. So when it comes to women's rights, um, I would like to highlight these two bits of the, of the act. Um, forced in talks is again, mostly a genre of of femdom and um yeah most of these things are going to <laughs> impact a lot of femdom content and I, I think it's very interesting that this is what we believe is going to lead to the liberation of women when what this means is that femdom content creators who a lot of times are women a lot of times are queer people a lot of times are BIPOC they are migrants again keep in mind that this is an identity this means that they are not going to be able to make money um, and as my two previous uh, co-panelists have mentioned, this is going to directly impact their access to housing. This is going to directly impact their access to safety. They may have to go back to, you know, dodgy relationships, dodgy partners, having to do other kinds of sex work to sustain themselves. Finally, the ECP, uh, English Collective of Prostitutes, released a brilliant report, Sex Workers Are Getting Screwed by Brexit, that highlights the issues that sex workers, migrant sex workers, already have uh, with the police. Uh, but this is only going to get worse uh, because now the, the police can target them through these advertising sites, thanks to the Online Safety Act. I um, highly encourage everyone to read the interview that Maya Oppenheim did with um, Audrey in The Independent about a month ago, where she says that she's already gone back to brothel work because of, of the OSA, because she, can't, she doesn't feel like she can advertise online anymore. Now, conclusion, finally. I think that um, the OSA is very, it has a lot of parallels with Foster Sesta, which isn't good news for anyone involved. We have seen that while attempts to censor pornographic content may in theory be geared towards uh, reducing its perceived harm against women or you know, advancing women's rights or liberation, they create a less diverse pornographic space where the only content that can exist is the, the one that repeats the same kind of like cis heterocentric tropes, because this is the safe content. This is the content that you are going to be able to sell. You know, if half of the platforms don't sell the content that you're making and you're trying to pay your rent, why would you continue to make the avant-garde weird content that you actually enjoy making that may be more feminist, maybe less misogynistic. If the misogynistic content is the content that is allowed to sell, that's the content that you will keep on making. It's very simple. Um, it also applies to other forms of art, sadly, uh, since non-pornographic platforms uh, have even more constrained terms of service. So what we saw after Fausto Sesta was that most queer comic creators that were on Tumblr completely lost their ability to make a living, which means that now there is less queer artwork out there, which I think personally is a loss for women's rights, no matter how you put it. By placing the onus of identifying and uh, eliminating this legal but harmful content on the platforms, as we've said before, like Fausto Sesta, this is literally ensuring that sex workers, migrants, artists, BIPOC, queer folk, we have less and less ability to simply exist online, less ability to create networks of support. For a very good review on this, please have a look at Erased by Hakim uh, Hustling. 2020, it's a report they put together after two years of Foster Sesta, and it really lays all this out very clearly. To recap, I am not claiming that pornography or sex work are empowering by any means, but I am claiming that those that partake in them are going to be impacted the most by the Online Safety Act. 
this law is not going to make people stop being kinky and it's not going to make people stop being into fetishes that you personally may not agree with but it's going to impact women sex working or not and our ability to make money which is going to impact our access to safety the online safety act is going to make dissident identities less findable online leading to loss of community and loss of networks it is going to make diverse porn less likely to exist and it's going to make it very difficult for artists to support ourselves via sex work, make it very difficult to promote any kind of complicated work online. It's not just going to diminish freedom of speech, it's going to diminish our access to better opportunities and to safety. So thank you so much for putting up with all of that and for listening to my presentation today. Uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter, drop me an email, and I'm starting a new series on TikTok. So if you'd like to follow along with that, it's going to be very nice and sexy. Alva, thank you so much. And best of luck for your um, series on TikTok. I hope it isn't too sexy or you will be, you will yeah, be taken indeed. off. I've already had to censor it. So there you go. Yeah. Um, thanks everybody so much. We're going to take a little break just so that we can all just like get some food, get some water, chill out, do work, whatever it is you need to do. And um, we'll be back um, broadcasting at 1.30. In the meantime, if you're looking for something to do, there is a challenging sex worker invisibility survey that is um, you might find down in the bottom toolbar. But apart from that, um, enjoy your break and I'll see you at half past one. <laughs>